Good morning. Hey, welcome to Hack Check Studios, everyone. RT Bear here. Hope you're all doing good on this fine Friday morning. I do believe it's Friday. Um, I've lost all track of time. I've lost track of everything. Look at my hair. Like crazy. I don't think I've had long hair like this since I was a hippie in my youth back in the 60s. <laughs> well, like I said, I hope everybody's doing good. Um, yeah, we're getting close to Easter. So, uh, you know, I hope everybody's got their Easter plans, got their baskets ready. Yeah, everything's hidden for the kids. Go find. Yeah, I don't know how the rules of Easter work. I mean, um, does the Easter bunny have a list like Santa and does he check it twice and find out who's naughty or nice or can anybody get Easter eggs? I don't know. Is there a criteria? Do you have to do something for the eggs? Like, like Christmas, you have to be good, right? So if you're good, you get presents. But Easter, everybody gets an egg, right? Yeah, everybody's good on Easter. <laughs> Equal opportunity. Oh, man, we already got a sign of life here. We got leg kick one. Hello, hello, hello. Um, there's the leg kick. Look at that. Sweep the leg, Johnny. We got Edwin the Ace Volume 3 coming soon. Alcio Vado or Ace Vado. <laughs> However you say it. However you say it, just don't call him late for dinner. Ah, uh, we got Marcus Killigrew. How are you, brother? Uh, Nordic Nerd. Hello. I just want to let everybody know, too, if there's there's people coming in and, and aren't real familiar with the morning show, the morning hullabaloo. This is just a free form. You know, I just come in uh, first thing in the morning, plop in front of the camera here and just hang out with you guys. So this is the hangout stream. I got a couple things I'm going to go over, but nothing big. Um, so you know, it's it's interactive. So anything you guys want to ask, anything you want to be part of, whatever, just, you know, just let me know and we'll riff back and forth um, and have a good time. It usually works out, man. Uh, I'm, I'm always pleasantly surprised when these things go well. Uh, you guys are the best. I feel like I've known most of you my whole life, you know, the way we get along here, um, you know, with the with the distance here, <laughs> we'd probably hate each other if we ever saw each other face to face. No, nah, nah. no hate from this guy. Just kidding. Uh, where did I leave off? Did I leave off with Nordic Nerd? We got the Normie Nerds. We got the nerd invasion happening here. Hey, Pedro, what happened, man? You didn't know uh, you weren't there for the uh, the Wednesday show, the Pontificator show. And you were like the guy that knew all the sexy uh, Star Trek women. We could have used you, man. We could have used you. So I hope everything's okay. And uh, hey, Pedro, I'm going to be sending uh, some books out to you very, very soon. I think Pamela wants to know how many you want. So she, I think she's trying to figure out how much the shipping's going to cost us to send... Uh, I don't know, a stack of books, high octane, black and white, high octane adventures uh, out to the land down under where you live, which is Australia, I believe. I believe. First one. Oh, Marcus. How are you? Hey, we got Philip. What's up, brother? Yeah, man, I feel like it's been some distance. I'm going to start trying to hang out a lot more. Uh, I feel like I feel like there's some distance between uh, the Zaid brothers and myself. We gotta we gotta reconnect, man. How many can I have? I don't know, man. It depends uh, on the shipping. I think Pamela's gonna do some research and see how much. I don't know, like three, five books or something like that's gonna cost. Um, and then she did say, you know, because it's gonna be expensive. You know, Australia isn't cheap. Um, you know, that maybe we could work something out after that. But I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we still got uh get, we're about a third of the way done with the campaign, fulfilling it. So about a third of the books have gone out. And uh, my wife is such a fair play type of person. She's not going like linear, like one through, I don't know, 1600 or whatever. 
she's trying to break it up. So like if you ordered this, she's going to send out so many of those. If you ordered that, there's so many of those. So she doesn't want to make anybody wait longer. So she's kind of jumping all over the place. And, and I said, I said, you know, just make it easy on yourself because it's, it's a little harder to do it that way. She goes, but I just want to be fair. I want to make sure or that everybody feels like, you know, they're not, if they, if they ordered late in the, in the campaign, they're not going to have to wait forever, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I said, eh, I don't think people really think that way, but, but that's how she is. She's a, she's got a sense of fair play. Um, Pedro says, I'll send uh, you the address to Miami mailbox. I'll take care of the rest. Oh, okay. Well then let me know, man. Let me know how many you want. Cause, uh, how many, I think we printed, we may have printed five, five to 800 extra, I think, over printing. So we can send you quite a bit. But like I said, it's, I think it's just going to come down to the shipping. Uh, but if we're just sending them to Miami, that's cool. So I, I guess you have a friend that lives in Miami or you visit them. <laughs> hey, man, if you're going to go to Miami, it's just like an hour flight from Miami here. So you got to you got to fly into Texas and we got to hang out. Then if you're going to if you're going to hang out in Miami. Uh, Marcus said just shared the link. Uh, thank you. And if anybody is so like minded, share the link. Let's get some eyes in here. Um, let people know that I'm still alive. Uh, Phil says, yes, bro, got to catch up. Man, I've been seeing uh, the artwork that you've been posting. Man, you put out some good books, man. That artwork's fantastic. Um, hey, Phil, Edwin. Oh, there's a new face. Uh, Citizen Ronan, when you got when you got a big question, Mark, um, like everything's in question. I, I think today, in today's society, everything's in question. So that's, that's not a bad little uh, piece of artwork there. Uh, and Dino, who's probably going to say something really uh, biting, cutting, but absolutely hilarious. Uh, and Dino Palacio, Art, tell your wife people waited this long. Uh, they can wait a little more. <laughs> uh, you tell her that. I'm not telling her that. Yeah, and I do appreciate all you guys waiting. I really, really do. Um, th there was a couple things happening. I think it, it was one of the things was the the a culmination. Is that the uh, uh, word of, of 40 years of doing comic books with, I know it's a little graphic, but with a gun to my head. That's, what, that's the way I always explained it. Like when you have a deadline, there's always this sense like things got to get done right and and that there's this dire emergency and um so your whole life like that getting the book done actually just consumes your whole existence um because you know it shouldn't be this way but it feels like your personal life your private life you know those things they can be put on the back burner because getting the book done is more important and I have to admit, uh, just being completely honest, moving from California to Texas, one was a was a big kind of detour that happened in the middle of the campaign. And not that I make excuses, so you guys don't think that. I'm just I'm just giving you like complete honesty of like what was going on in my life. And so when we moved out here. You know, there's a lot of things to do. You got to adjust. You know, you got to figure out the, you know, how to uh, navigate with the in the new terrain that you're in, and and all the other stuff. And I must I must say this this Christmas, this coming Christmas, will be four years. We'll be here four years. So um, yeah, it's we've been here for a while, and uh, so part of it was. You know, working in the industry for 40 years, finding a new location, and also Texas in the woodlands where we're at, it's a lot more, not that it's slow pace, not that it's like, oh, it's backwoods or anything like that. It's not. But coming from where I was 
and being an older guy and doing, uh, you know, working in comics as long as I have, I kind of felt like I earned a little bit of a break, right? So I didn't work at the same pace. I worked every day and I worked, you know, eight to 10 hours, but I didn't work the same kind of intensity that I used to, like the same crazy ass focus, right? So if there was something I wanted to watch on YouTube, I'd go get it. I would I would plop it in front of the drawing board and I would watch it. So when you're watching and drawing, your, your attention isn't that great. So there was stuff like that where I, I just felt like, I wanted to take it at a slower pace and also at a slower pace, I felt like I could do a better job. So, you know, I was looking up reference. I was trying to figure out how to, you know, do this stuff for, for real this time, instead of, like I said, with a gun against my head, you know, just trying to go with the first thing that looked, looked proper and that you could get the, the stuff out there. You know, I was actually like, well, instead of that type of compromise, there's something specific I have in mind. So if it takes me three attempts at it, then I'm going to take three attempts at it. So the first attempt isn't going to go out. So I gave myself some time to explore and also kind of self-educate uh, in a way that I felt I never had time before because of the gun to the head and just trying to make a living. So um, so there was a lot of that. And uh, and then there was also just the pressure that I wanted to make it really, really good. So there was a lot of things going on um, at the time trying to get the book done. But um, this next this next volume or this next story arc, I should say, is it's going to it's going to um, we're going to do the campaign towards the end of this year. So we're, we're not going to do it. We're not going to fund you know, go, uh, you know, try to get backers and all that stuff early. We're going to wait. And I have a writer and I guess, I guess it's safe to say, I can say his name now. Uh, it's Aaron Sparrow. So I'm working with Aaron Sparrow and we have two volumes blocked out. Like the, the story is blocked out. So beginning, middle and end for the first volume, beginning, middle and end for the second volume. I wanted to do it as 100 page story, but it's just really not feasible. It, it would just take too long to even get a campaign going. So I'm going to do it the same way I did volume one, volume two, but I'm bringing in some backup. So it's not going to be me doing everything this time. So I have, um, and if anybody got the book so far, uh, you, you've seen the uh, the backup store. You've seen the uh, the epilogue. And um, yeah, I, I, I got a great artist coming in and uh, he's working with me on this and his name's Alan Patrick and uh, Alan Patrick and I did the, did the epilogue together. So my layouts, his breakdowns. And, and if you don't know what breakdowns are, I'll be educating you guys as it goes, but I did a lot. I've worked off breakdowns a lot in my career. So um when I worked on Adventures of Superman, I got breakdowns from Dan Jurgens. A lot of the stuff I did with Jim Lee on the X-Men, Jim was giving me breakdowns. Even Wills was giving me breakdowns on uh, Uncanny towards the end there. So these guys know I can do finishes. And so finishes are, well, breakdowns pretty much are just kind of like, if you think about it, like a coloring book, it's all just line work. There's no shading. There's no shadows. There's no hatching. There's no nothing. It's basically just outlines of stuff. So you've got proportion, composition, you know, and and pretty much all the drawings intact. The, the costumes sometimes vary, um, but usually it's the drawing is intact. Not always. I mean, sometimes... Like if you do breakdowns, sometimes hands won't be resolved. Certain things won't be resolved. So you go in there and you finish it up. So that's why they call it finish it. So you do the rendering, you do the shadowing, you do all that stuff. So um, I originally was going to work with Joe Bennett, actually, on the next volume. So volume, I don't know what to call it. I don't know. Like I'm just calling it, uh, I'm calling it the sins of the father. So it's the sins of the father story arc. That's what Aaron and I, Aaron Sparrow and I are working on right now. And um, I asked Joe Bennett if he would do it. Joe said he would. 
So that was great. I was on cloud nine because we did a, we did a cover together. Actually, I think I have it here. Uh, it came out fantastic. And Joe, actually, when I was working with him at DC the last time out, this is Joe's breakdown breakdowns and my uh, finished inks. So, so when I was working with him on Hawkman, and when I was working with him on Terminator Deathstroke, uh, they were pretty much breakdowns. There was very little. Well, there was no rendering, um, but Joe kind of throws in blacks, black shapes, shadows, and stuff like that. So it wasn't, but it was really rough, you know. And um, and there was things that weren't really resolved. So I worked with him that way. So I was thinking. It would be cool because I want it to look a certain way, like like the finished look aesthetically. I want it to look a certain way, um, and I can do that quickly. But like the drawing, the indecision, the storytelling, that stuff, that takes me a little bit longer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work with Alan Patrick on it. And if you guys have got the book, you guys know what that epilogue looks like, and it's gorgeous. It's really really good. Um, so I have a style in mind that I'm going to work and it's going to, it's going to look real similar to, you know, volume two, and I'm going to keep that look. And then I'm going to just keep working off that, just kind of try to make it better. And, and you know, we're, as artists, we're always struggling for something, right. Uh, a, a way to do things faster, a way to do things better, a way to make it be more true to what your vision is. And so I'm going to be doing that, um, you know, in the finished work. So um, in theory, Aaron and I, uh, Aaron Sparrow and I, we are going, he actually, we have it blocked out. We, I call them acts, but like, like I break down scenes in the story. And so, so I like compartmentalize the scenes as I'm writing. So then I kind of think of, this scene is this, and I even have names for it. This scene is that, and then I have names for it. And and then there's a page count, like oh, it's the opening scenes in in Mexico at a at a a dig site or whatever. And so then I go, well, that's five pages. And so then I can break it down that way. And then so what Aaron and I are going to do is we're going to break it down and get a working script uh, plot that can be drawn from. Hey Pamela, if you can wrestle that toy away from Arrow, could you do that? Because uh, he's going to start annoying uh, people in chat. <laughs> I just gave that toy back to him, and I had a feeling he was going to bring it up. Oh, cool! And uh, so, so yeah, so so the the idea is we're going to have that pretty soon. Hold on for a minute. I got a cold, so I'm a little congested. Um, so we're going to have that working plot very soon. So so the first two acts are kind of worked out, or the first two scenes. So then he's going to, uh, Aaron's going to block it out as far as a, a, a plot that could be drawn from, and then we're going to send that out. And so the idea is that this, this year the story will be done, both, both volumes will be done in a plot that can be drawn from and then we're going to see how much of this we can get done before we even launch um the indiegogo so i'm hoping a big chunk of the book can be done before we even launch so then when we give you a due date or you know a, a launch date or fulfillment date or whatever it's called then we'll be able to be more accurate you know, and we'll be able to, to keep our word because the thing is there's so many variables to these campaigns and there's, there's so many unforeseen things. And, um, and I've never done stuff like this before. So, um, you know, uh, it is what it is. So there's a lot of new uh, faces in here. I, I, I can't even begin to say this. Uh, so Courier Elt. So, Cur <laughs> uh, uh Sorry if I butchered your name, but uh, how you doing? Uh, we got Antonio, uh, Anthony Gonzalez, Clark. 
What's up? Uh, how you doing, brother? Um, saying hi to the chat. Thanks for getting that toy from him. No problem. Uh, citizen, you want to say anything to the people? Hey, everyone. And she's busy getting books out to you guys. So anybody that backed Black and White Man versus Machine, uh, books are going to go out today as well. So uh, Pamela tries to get books out every day. And for the most part, uh, she does. So uh, let's see. Citizen Ronan says, uh, you're always open and upfront about everything. People are going to be blown away uh, by the book. Uh, the art is phenomenal. Uh, thank you so much, man. Thank you. That's that's what keeps me going. And uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna try to catch up in the chat, and then I'm gonna. You inspired me. I got a handwritten letter um, from a backer, and I'm gonna read it um, on. I haven't got a handwritten like in the day in '94. I got a stack of handwritten letters. You know the the '94 image uh, series, black and white. And that was great, man. People drew me pictures and stuff, and it, it was it was awesome. So now with with technology being the way it is, it almost feels like we're interacting right now. You're telling me how you feel and all that stuff. And then there's you know with in Indiegogo, there's the you know the um, the area where you can you know updates and you guys can contact me and, st and stuff like that. So so it almost seems like uh, it, it it almost is unnecessary. But when you get this, it kind of feels, I, I guess, one, it's tangible, and the other is that, um, I don't know, it feels like somebody took more time, you know, more thought in doing it, which is kind of strange. I, I guess maybe it's because of the, you know, um, putting it in an envelope, putting a stamp on it, you know, and then and then uh, putting it in the mailbox and all that stuff. It feels like there's more... Uh, you know, uh, there's more done, you know, uh, bu 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 bu. uh, Normie nurse says, will the original layout pages be random choice or backer choice? They're random. They're random. The only exception I made was, and just because I've known this guy forever and he's a good friend is Dan Frega. So Dan asked for a specific layout page and I sent that to him. But otherwise, it's kind of first come, first serve. So I believe uh, when I pack them up for my wife, to, they're all in in um, like one, two, three, four. So, so as she's fulfilling them, they're all going to be pulled in order. But I don't think that's going to make much of a difference because she's not really going in order of, of who ordered you know what I mean? Like, like number order. She's not going that way. And so, like I said earlier, she's kind of randomly picking stuff. So she feels it's more fair, um, you know, instead of making everybody wait for their layout pages, when she gets to that, she's doing a few layout pages here. She's doing a few things here, a few things there, just so it can you know, have a sense of, uh, of fairness, I guess, you know, I don't know, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I she does not like me being involved with any of that. So she has a process and I, I ask her, like, can I help you? And sometimes she'll say, yeah. And most of the time she's like, no, it's OK. So she's got a process. And I think anybody who's done something like this, sometimes somebody else coming in, even if they have good intentions, can kind of throw a wrench in the mix. And so, you know, I help her. Um, I've been helping her take the stuff to the to the uh, post office because we get these bins and uh, and they're they're quite heavy so we got to drag those in and it's weird like our our uh, our uh, post office here we can't go through the back like they have these gates and you can't get through them and we've asked them we could just drive right up to the back and we could just fill this thing up and drive it right you know push it right up to you and they go no. And so they, they they make us go through the front door. And one, I mean, there's traffic going through the front door. And also this bin, it might be an inch on either side. Like it is so close to the door, um, it barely fits um, through there. And you got to go through two doors. Well, actually three doors. So it's a little tough to navigate. And if there's people in there, yeah, it's like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, you know. 
so it's kind of weird. So uh, I've been helping her out with that. So anyway, she needs help. I, I do. But um, but yeah, um, let me uh, stay focused. Yeah, so I, I hope that that answered the question. So they are they are random. Um, but they're all pretty damn good. Like even the more sketchier ones, I think those one they have charm to them, but two, some of these don't follow the finished page. So you get to see work in progress. So sometimes a panel will be different. Sometimes the whole page layout will be different. And some of the pages, some of the layouts are really, really detailed. So it's just it's just going to be kind of a crapshoot on what you get. But I believe they're all really, really good pages. Uh, a lot for, like I said, different different reasons. Uh, we got we got an Aaron Sparrow fan. If you guys are fans of uh, Thinking Critical, uh, Aaron's on there all the time. He's come on uh, Pontificators a few times, and um, I, I met him through uh, Clownfish. So uh, Neon uh, would set these things up, and we would hang out, and just kind of riff off of uh, you know comic book topics. And he's just a great guy. Has a lot of knowledge about comic books, and worked as an editor on the Disney comics. So the guys were—he's written comics, he's edited comics. I mean, he's—you know—he's multifaceted. So he really understands things. And when I'm working with him, it—it it feels like we're simpatico. Like we're like I don't have to overly explain things to him. He just kind of understands them intuitively and if you guys have watched me long enough you know i struggle <laughs> communication is not my uh is not my forte so uh so he's really good at kind of reading between the lines and um and ripping it seems like no matter what i pitch him or what i throw out there he's he's right in tune with it and you guys don't know how how hard that is to find somebody like that. And so, so far, so good. The hardest thing is just finding time because he's busy, I'm busy. And uh, so I set up these uh, StreamYard face-to-face uh, -face like this. I just don't go live. And he and I work on the story uh, like that. But at this point, um, he's just got to get me an outline of the first issue and then I just, I'm pretty sure it'll be, it'll be perfect. Cause last conversation we had, everything was lined up. Right. Um, but sometimes when you see it on paper, it's, it's something, it becomes something completely different. Um, so I'm hoping that doesn't happen. And if it does, if it doesn't, then we got those first two acts. Um, and then he's going to craft those and boom, they're going out to the, to the, uh, the breakdowns, to get breakdowns, and then I'm going to start doing finishes. So we should be actually working on, like, full-scale working on this book soon, like, really, really soon, and that makes me excited. Just to be able to say it out loud right now, it makes me excited. And, um, and then um, we're going to have Brian doing the coloring. Oh, my gosh, that guy is a freaking genius. And he bugs me at least once a week. Like, where's Pages? Where's Pages? He is enthusiastic. He loves he loves my drawing, which is a plus. And he, he loves the subject matter. And uh, you can tell because he's inspired by it. I've seen his other work. No slant against anybody that's hiring him for other things. But he gives me it, it, it's inspiration like he gives me great great stuff um so uh fantastic so good morning uh we got gray wolf uh graphics uh w wd smith uh hey yeah uh, when i saw wd i think walt disney did you guys hear um i don't know how some of the disney shills are spinning it but um from what i understand by uh resources i trust uh, Disney lost their um, case against Florida because um, what Florida DeSantis wanted to – well, one, Disney overstepped their boundaries, I believe, when they, uh, they started telling DeSantis and Florida how they should run things. Um, 
and it was the I, I can never remember the number, and I hate saying it this way because it's the propaganda way that just say whatever. Um, uh, what well, what was the? It was the transgender campaign or whatever, and so uh, Disney decided to make a stand against it. Uh, they protested it. They went after DeSantis. And then DeSantis said, this is really none of your business, what we do here. Um, you're not even a Floridian company. Like, you're a California company. You just happen to have a, a theme park here. So he told them to back off. They didn't. And so then he said he was going to go after their special their special district privileges, which is Riddy Creek uh, or Reedy Creek. And um, – so uh, Disney countersued with freedom of speech, blah, 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 all this freaking weird stuff. And it recently came down that the freedom of speech thing has been thrown out. Um, Riddy Creek has been dissolved. Uh, Florida is now overseeing, um, you know, uh, the Disney parks plans and that the safety and all that stuff is going through Florida you know, um, they have a new division that uh, I guess it's kind of like a hybrid of what Riddy Creek was and then uh, what the new Florida run division is. So there's it's kind of a hybrid. And so I'm thinking that now there's checks and balances, right? Uh, Disney has to check with Florida in a way that they didn't before. And all those special rights and privileges that that Florida gave to Disney was under a different idea. Like the reason they did that is because there was going to be this thing called Epcot and Epcot was going to be a real city with real businesses and it's, it, it needed governing body and all that other stuff. So they granted privileges for that, but it was never dissolved. Um, even though Epcot changed and became a theme park instead of a real world, exp, you know, place. Um, but it was never reevaluated or anything like that. So, you know, since Disney wasn't going to back off, DeSantis decided that he was going to look into this and uh, and they dissolved it. So I think for me personally, I think Disney needs to be humbled. They're not they're not self-correcting. I think the fans have spoken, but they're not self-correcting at this point. And I uh, I think that pressure like this will help them get the idea that you know, people don't want this stuff. You know, people don't don't like you, you know, having to not answer to anybody and just being able to, to, to play politics within your entertainment and an agenda within your entertainment. It's like nobody, that's never been a thing. People would always, they hated to be talked down to. They hated to be preached to. These were things that people universally hated. And now for some reason, a certain entertainment group of people think like they have to do it. They have to interject their politics, their belief systems, those things into the work. And by doing that, you put off a general audience. And also the way they are doing it, they're driving a wedge between this group of people and that group of people that loved your product. Why are you forcing people to decide one way or the other? It's weird. It's really, really strange. But I applaud this stuff. I think sometimes things have to get worse before they can get better. And so I think it's a good thing. So I, I it's going to be interesting to see how the Disney shills spin it because they might, you know, like, oh, it's a win-win. It's a, you know, whatever, you know, <coughs> try to spin it somehow where it sounds better for Disney. But I think it's a major blow for Disney to, to lose because it's also, uh, they got tax breaks, tax shelters, things like that uh, through this Ritty Creek. And um, it's going to change Disney's way of doing business. Disney World, I should say, way of doing business. Which, like I said, I don't like to hurt anybody. You know, I don't like any of that stuff. But sometimes people have to kind of you have their butts kicked before they'll do the right thing. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, I never really finished. I just kind of assumed. But, yeah, Joe Bennett um, isn't available because um, during that, 
I guess the Eric July thing happened. And Joe didn't back out completely, but he couldn't get started by the date I needed him to. So then uh, Joe works with two, uh, two assistants. And so Alan Patrick is one of those guys, and that's his right-hand man. So uh, Joe is actually the guy that got me um, connected with um, Alan Patrick. So Alan Patrick doesn't draw exactly like Joe Bennett, but there's similarities. And if there's no rendering and there's none of that, then um, – I'm free to do whatever I want. And already, like, um, there's certain things that I do to his characters that um, to kind of put them on on my model versus his. So I don't think it's going to look like anything you've seen before. I mean, it's going to look a little Joe Bennett-ish, uh, Alan Patrick-ish, and a little bit like black and white, like me. So... It's going to be a pretty cool combination, I think. And like I said, if you got the book, you'll you'll see four pages there. Yeah. <laughs> pretty close. I don't think I was close at all, but thanks uh, to saying your name right. Zay says, Art, uh, you should come out uh, to uh, Dallas Fan Expo. You know what? I mean, not uh, not to be a a sad sack. Um, I have a really bad back, and uh, for the last year, I've been seeing like doctors and specialists and things like that. And at one point, I was told that they could help me um, through surgery, things like that. And so, I the last specialist I saw, they said it's it's kind of it is what it is. And there's really nothing we can do. And so sometimes it's hard for me just to walk. Uh, I do think, like I said, I don't want to bring everybody down, but I do think this will probably cripple me in time. So um, there are times I walk with a cane and uh, stuff like that. And I think for me to travel, like even though Dallas isn't that, well, Texas is big. So Dallas is still a little bit of a haul. Uh, Houston would be a lot uh you know, like closer, but um, I just really can't do it. Uh, I want to visit my friend in California um, and uh, I'm trying to figure out like if I could do that. Um, and then uh, I also got invited to um, like one of you guys like invited me to Universal, I think for that Epic Universe thing. Like he invited me like, you know, um, just to go and hang out. And uh, that would be a great time to do, you know. Um, I'm not sure what it entails. I haven't indulged him yet. So if you're listening to the chat, um, sorry, I haven't got back to you because I'm trying to figure out if I could even physically do it. So I have these muscle relaxers and I have these, these painkillers, but I also have a very high tolerance um, to that stuff. Like I can drink. I can drink pretty good because my metabolism kind of breaks it down quickly. So, um, so that stuff doesn't really work too well for me. So I've been trying to, uh, I do these, these ab crunches and these leg lifts, but I do them like with all this back support. Um, so I don't do them like they're really supposed to be done. So I lay, lay, uh, or I sit and then I just kind of crunch, you know, um, and I do about 500 a day. And then the leg lift, I just kind of lift slightly laying on my back, but I don't bring it, you know, my knees all the way up to, you know, my body and all that stuff because I just, I can't, it, if I hurt myself, it, it takes me days to recover. So I try to be uh, real cool with that. So, yeah, I mean, I know that's a lot more um, than you expected, Phil, and I would love to start doing some of these shows, but um, it's just really hard for me to travel. Um, I've been trying to walk uh, Arrow, Inco, Inco, uh, but even that's kind of getting tough. We got Spaceman, Spaceman Spiff, Healthy Bear, a blessed good Friday to you and your family. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, 
I got to figure out what my wife's going to do as far as church. I, I don't go to church on a regular basis, but on, on special occasions, I go with her. Uh, Henry, good morning. Good morning. Yes, Webb, DeSantis is uh, two uh, against Disney now. What is, t- what is 2-0? I don't know what that means. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, I don't I don't really know like the details of that, but from what I understand, DeSantis pretty much everything he set out to do, he's achieved. Um Pastmaster Dan, good day. What's up? You know, not hurting art, uh anyone art. Uh this is self-inflicted. <laughs> Uh, oh my god look at this name this is a dyslexic nightmare all gold productions well, that was easier than I, it, it looked like initially um sometimes like there's patterns that my eye will follow and i think like the ll after the a kind of works as one word and then i can see the go and then the ld and then the d kind of separates productions like I look for patterns because I'm dyslexic, so I can kind of figure things out, but um, it's not easy. Uh, Paulus Arts, hail. We, we're getting good, sh- uh, getting a show of people here. This is good. Johnny Rando, uh, hey, Art, uh, scheduled to get my black and white books today. Oh, man, cool. Hey, you guys got to make sure. Take pictures of the books you ordered and all the goodies, and please post them up and uh, and tag me in it because I love w- looking at that. And also, it really does help because um, it helps me get the word out that we're in fulfillment. Because believe it or not, I mean, campaigns like bigger campaigns like this, sometimes it takes a while to get everybody on the same page. You know, uh, there are people that still have asked me, like, when's the book start shipping? You know, it's like, well, I gave an update. I did this, you know, but, um, you know, some people follow me on, you know, X. Some people follow me on, you know, YouTube. Some people just use the Indiegogo updates. So there's various ways that um, and sometimes they don't cross over. So people don't know. Um, Art, do you need a live in assistant? Uh, oh, oh, live in, I live in, <laughs> I'm here. You know, your artwork, uh, I haven't seen you post it in a while, but it was getting pretty damn good, man. Stay with it. Ah, comic book, Bob. My dad gets a uh, nerve, what is that? Ablations? I don't know how to say that word uh, for his, uh, God, all these damn words, uh, issues. I, so I, I take it it's back issues, and uh, is that some kind of, um, like, treatment? Yeah, like, this doctor told me that I could get a shot, and it's I guess it's some kind of painkiller, and it will stay in the system for X amount of time, and then you got to kind of keep updating it. And um, to be honest, I, I've had a lot of, like, back, and, and different problems in the, in the past. And uh, I don't like to be on any kind of painkillers and stuff. Um, I just don't like it. And also, I end up feeling like a junkie because I have to take more. Like after three days or four days of taking it, it doesn't do anything anymore. And then I just have to keep upping the dose. So I find like if I don't take it, if I go the opposite, I don't take it as long as I can. I can go, and then if the pain escalates, and then I take the medicine, it works better. And then I try to wean myself off it again and then do it. Uh, um, so more information than you guys probably care, but uh, but it's all good, man. Uh, Dr. Ben, do you work on backs, Dr. Ben? Uh, morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. Oh, he's got two wins against them. Good, good. Oh, two and oh, like uh, like a score. I got it now. Yeah.
Well, take care, Pedro. Have a great day. And thanks again, man, for your great work on uh, high octane. Let's see what Anthony Gonzalez says. Hope you heal up. Uh, need an artist for something? Let me know. Uh, working on stuff with Shane. Wow. And Chuck, uh, love to add you to the roster. Um, I don't know how you can send stuff. Um, send me stuff through X or Facebook. And let me see what you got there. I'm not really looking for anybody, but sometimes if things look really good, like like Pedro, like that High Octane Adventures, that book wasn't even in my mind's eye until he started showing me his work. And, and then I was like, I got to work with this guy. So I created an opportunity that I could. So sometimes opportunities come out of talent. So, yeah, send me some stuff. Uh, Wilbur Force Wooster. Uh, and the only reason I know how to say that is because uh, I've heard other YouTubers say that, and uh, it's such a great name. Uh, I am getting a package today. Woohoo! I think it's black and white too. Sweet baby Christmas. What? Um, I don't have Twitter. Uh, you have sent those books into the void. What books? Hmm. I got to catch up. I got to catch up. I got I got stuff I want to show you guys, but I always get behind. Uh, all all gold pro, uh, productions. Uh, what I mean by uh, that comment was sorry to see. Oh. Oh, were you? Somebody contacted me, uh, DM'd me, and wrote me a great um, like. Uh, well, let me back up first. Yeah, uh, sometimes I see like friends. I still consider them friends. They post some some stuff like on Facebook or X or something, and then uh, I'll comment, and I'll comment in a way that's counter to whatever point they're trying to make. So let me um, pull this down. Um, and so Scott Dunbeer, who I, I still consider a friend, I don't, to me, nothing has changed between us, but uh, there's some people that kind of um, lost their minds. And I'm not saying Scott has, but that, you know, when, when Donald Trump, you know, was, was voted in as president, there's a lot of people that kind of lost their minds. And then they, they drew this line in the sand. And so anybody that, supported Trump, or they even felt supported Trump. And then it went even further. If you were a Republican, period, then you were like America's most wanted. You were like public enemy number one. And I I just, I, I, it, it took me years to kind of come to terms with like, can this actually be, can people be like this? And yes, they can. So so um, Dunbeer posted this image that had um, – it was an hourglass. It was The artwork was pretty good. And it had Trump's image at the top of – inside the hourglass on the top. And if you guys know what an hourglass is like, it, it will keep an hour of time. So you flip it over, it fills up, flip it back. And so by the time that sand goes from all the top to the bottom part – that's an hour. And so an hourglass with Donald Trump's image at the top. So it said something like time's running out. That's it. So what it meant is time's running out for Donald Trump. I assume it had something to do with his trial and stuff like that. I don't know. Like this cryptic stuff, I don't really keep up with it. So I'm like, I'm not even really sure what the point of this is. But anyway, I thought, and this is just my observation, like people are still like for the last four years with Joe Biden as president, they're still really hung up on Donald Trump and they still blame Donald Trump for a lot of stuff that's happening today. Um, even though when when Biden took office, he took great pride in eradicating just about everything that Donald Trump had put and built in the four years that he was there. And so they all applauded that that's what Joe Biden had done, right? So supposedly there was no trace of Donald Trump in the White House anymore, right? 
at least that's what they said. So then I'm kind of scratching my head. Why do they still care about Donald Trump? He's not even, he's not even like, he's not a Senator. He's not even in the political realm. Like he can't make law. He can't, he can't change anything legally. He's, he's in the private sector. He's just Donald Trump again. That's all he is. He's the same as he was before he was the president. As far as I'm concerned, right? He's got, he's, he's looking at maybe, you know, uh, trying to be president again, but he's not in any place that he can change anything, right? That's Joe Biden's job now. Joe Biden can do those things, but Donald Trump cannot, right? He's not the president. So I just said, I said, why do people get so crazy about Donald Trump? He has no power. He can't, he's not the president anymore. That's all I said. And and it is, it's a it's a sincere question. I wasn't trying to be a jerk or anything. I was like, why is this? And so then they <laughs> it just it just got crazy. I think this is no, this isn't it. This was it. Um, and so then the next thing I know, you know, people are swarming on me like. Oh, you know, you know, Donald Trump is evil. He's done so much even like outside of the White House. And basically, it's kind of like what you hear about SJWs. They're not they're not satisfied until they can completely obliterate you, like like not just hurt you, but like like get you fired or or worse, like put you behind bars or kill you. Right. These are like the results like they want they want these like really permanent kind of results and i i don't understand that i'm glad i don't understand that because then i would have to be like them i'm not like them i don't really see it that way i see it as like joe biden is a horrible president i know my way of life personally has changed when my wife and i moved to texas from california this was like a haven like everything was so affordable. Everything was accessible, not just like to get by, but to excel in life, right? And and within, we had two years, maybe a year and a half of that feeling. And then Joe Biden policies, boom, 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 one after another. And now I'm paying twice the amount for almost everything. Uh, I lost eighty thousand dollars in my investments eighty thousand i think we've brought it back maybe half almost half but i'll never make that back in my lifetime i'm an older guy you know i'm going to be using that money soon so i don't have another 20 years to accumulate you know that 80k so his administration has cost me he's doubled Everything that I pay for for annually, you know, all my expenses have have doubled, doubled. This is this is insane, and I lost eighty k. This is this is nuts. Like like eighty k in Texas. I I could put a down payment on like four houses. Like that's a lot of money. Um, California, it's not that much at all. But you know, you could it still could. You could do good in California with that money, but here you could do crazy, crazy well. And so anyway, I, I posted that, as he said, uh, as all gold production said, then they swarmed me. And then it becomes personal. It becomes like, God, I can't believe how stupid you are, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I can't remember any of the exact things, but I mean, it was a lot, right? But the ones... Because most of those people I don't know, you know, and so unless it's somebody I really care about that says something, it's not going to hurt me. So I don't care what any of those people say. You know, Scott, like I said, I consider a friend. As far as I know, Eric Larson and I have never had a fight. So I, I still think of Eric Larson and myself as having the same relationship we've always had. Mark Wade, I haven't. I'm starting to reevaluate my my I guess idea of what our relationship was or or is 
but I worked with him in the past. I never had any beef with him personally, you know, so as far as I know, I've never had any problem with any of these guys personally, right? But I know them, I've hung out with them, I've worked with them in the past. So not close friends, but I would say working professional friends, acquaintances, right? So, um, so then um, I think the first one was uh, Scott Dunbar said, you know, you know, I can't believe you, you feel this way or what, because what I never said, I voted for Trump. I never said anything in these things. I just said, like, sometimes I feel like the right and left are the same. It's just like some of the window dressings different, but usually the outcomes we get effed one way or another. Like somehow something gets stripped from us. Something gets take, taken from us. Some of our freedoms, like it seems the same to me, right? And also I think if you if you say you're a fair-minded individual and you only vote for one party all the time, then to me, to me personally, then you're not a fair-minded person because you're not you're not evaluating everything. You're you're not even really necessarily thinking because you're going to vote your party regardless of whoever it is. And if that's the case, then then objectivity is out. You're just voting your party. And um, and so I was saying not stuff exactly like that, but kind of like left, right. They're both ass hats. And as far as I'm concerned, they both wear the same hats or they're, you know, something like that, you know. So I'm just trying to just give them the point of view like you hate Donald Trump. I don't necessarily. Well, you know what? I do hate Joe Biden. You know, um, because but I hate him because of personally, I hate his politics. I don't hate him as a person necessarily, um, but I hate his politics. And and he has hurt me. He's cost me money. So it is personal to me. Like like Trump didn't. My way of life was better under Donald Trump. Right. So I don't have any animosity to him. A lot of this weird politics stuff that that they say he's done or whatever, like, how did that really affect you personally? How did that affect your way of life? How did it affect your neighborhood? You know, all that stuff. It it really didn't. Um, but open borders, paying twice of what you did before this guy took office, you know, uh, I don't know, losing money in your retirement, those things, I... I'm sorry, I don't forgive you, man, uh, unless you turned everything around tomorrow. And and not only did it go back to what it was, but it was better so I could get back that money that I lost, then maybe we could talk. Other than that, Joe Biden, you're on my shit list, and I wish you would just retire. Just go away. Take Kamala Harris with you. Let's get some better, brighter people in there. You know that will hopefully do better for America. But anyways, I'm really getting up on my soap opera, uh, soapbox. Um, so anyway, uh, Dunbeer says he says, um, you know, did you vote for Trump? Like he says to me, because I'm not making it clear. And to be honest, it's really nobody's business. I'll tell people I want to tell, you know, and if you listen to the show, you kind of understand where my politics are at. But, you know, it's never been a thing before. It's never going to be a thing, but, you know, after. My parents taught me sex, religion, and politics. You want to piss people off? Bring those things up, right? So I already know it's it's a, you know, you push buttons when you talk about stuff like this. But you know, I thought it was kind of rude, you know, where, you know, he he assumed I was a Trump person. And then if I bought if I bought into what he said, and I said, yeah, I support Trump. I'm 100 percent, you know, Trump MAGA, you know, Republican guy, you know, then fuck, you know, God help us. Right. I mean, I would have been attacked even more so than I was. And so I just wrote back and I said, you know, I understand what you're trying to do and I don't appreciate it. You know, you're trying to, you know, you want to out me so then you guys can hate me. You know, basically like a definitive, yeah, I support Donald Trump. So then they could go, 
fuck this guy, right? Let's just let's just swarm on this guy and really teach him a lesson. But I wasn't going to do that. So I just said, you know, I think both parties are similar. And then and then everybody was like, you can't use that. You can't say that. That's a that's a lame excuse, whatever, whatever. It's like if you look, most of the people that back like the big corporations, things like that, they're behind both parties. You know, they're hedging their bets. You know, basically a, a president is just a puppet anyway. I don't I don't really. I, and then I said I did say that in, in that thread as well. I said. I said, you actually think that Joe Biden's running the country like like you're supporting Joe Biden. How do you support Joe Biden? Like, how could you say Joe Biden is a better president than Donald Trump? Donald Trump, at very the very least, could walk and he could talk. Right. Joe Biden has problems doing both. You could go, well, it's 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 ageism. You can't, you shouldn't say these things about people. But the thing is, it's a fact. Even if Donald Trump or I mean, there's people that are that are Joe Biden's age that are way more, you know, coherent, you know, they're way more with it than that guy. Some people, I mean, you play the, the hand that you're dealt, right? The guy is diminishing. That happens when you get older. It's a fact of life. We shouldn't pretend that, oh, he's as spry as a as a young pup. Look at that guy. You know, he's he's on top of his game. He's not on top of his game. It's it's a fact, a hundred percent fact, right? But then these guys say stuff like, well, he's great, he's this and that. Well, now you're just lying to me. Like if we can't even talk, like if we can't even talk honestly about Joe Biden. Like, why do you care so much about this guy, right? He's just another president, just another president in a long line of presidents. Who gives a shit? You're going to die on that hill? You're going to die defending Joe Biden? He can't do the job. He, he can't even do the minimum of the job requirement. Why would you defend somebody like that? I, I've said before, I, I mean it kind of seriously, but it's a joke. I wouldn't trust that guy to drive me to the airport. He would he would kill us all. <laughs> but anyway, um, so then uh, who was it? It was uh, Eric Larson chimes in because I said something about um, how has our lives got better, you know, since Joe Biden. And, and of course, they have a laundry list of stuff, but it's for the laundry list that they could provide, I could provide for Donald Trump. So I think like when they do that, it's just tit for tat. Like it's not really better. It's better to you, but it's not better to me. And then they argue like, well, the reason everything's expensive now is because of the world. The world is suffering from the same effects. Everything's expensive now in the world. It's like, I don't fucking care about the world. I care about where I live. I care about the United States. I'm sorry I know people from other countries, you know, listen, but those are your problems. That's why we have different countries that we all ruled in different ways, like some for better, some for worse, right? That's why we aren't one world government. It only becomes an issue when it is a one world government. What do I give a shit about China? What do I care about Germany? What, what do I care about these countries, right? And their, their economy. I don't. I care about where I live, right? So when you bring up stuff like that, I'm like, well, what does that have to do with America? You know, oh, China is even experiencing this. Uh, well, I don't care. And and maybe if we weren't so interconnected with all these other countries, then we could course correct on our own, like we've always been able to do before. <coughs> you know, without, you know, all this globalization and all these ripple effects. I mean, how do you make these decisions, you know, like a single decision and take all this shit into consideration, you know, the only way you could do that is you have to homogenize the entire world to a one way of thinking 
And then you can make policy as if like the one world, it's a small town, right? Then you can make these, and that's what they want to do. They want to basically condense the entire world into a manageable group. And then they can just make these policies. They as in the powers that be. And it's not, you know, Joe Biden. He's just a piece. You know, it's not Donald Trump. He's just a piece, you know. Um, but anyway, so then, uh, you know, he chimed in, Eric did, but he didn't make it personal. He didn't say anything like, Art, you're, you're an idiot or anything like that. Um, I thought that Scott Dunbeer was kind of, he was toting that line, but Eric didn't, okay? And like I said, like Eric, I never had a beef with. And Eric, actually, I, I posted a black and something about black and white. And he chimed in. He made kind of a joke, like a like a fun observation. And he said, he said, you know, I always thought it was funny that, you know, Image published black and white in color. And then I green lit up a story not too long ago. It was called In Color, but it was in black and white. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. That's fun. That's how comics, that's how we used to be, right? And that was fun, you know? So, so I think we could still find, like, just get past this. And, you know, there is commonality there. We, we can get along. And so that's basically what I was trying to say in this, in this stream. But then, but then Mark Wade, Mark Wade comes in and, uh, and he just says this, hold on, I'm getting dry. He says this thing. He says, uh, how's business going, Art? Meaning you're not lo no longer working for the mainstream, you know, that your career must be in the toilet. Right? That's what he meant by that. Um, being a snarky, I mean, if you're going to say something, like, just say it outright, like, you know, don't say it like that. Like that's whatever. It, it, like I said, it doesn't really bother me. I don't care. It doesn't hurt me. I just find it interesting. And so, you know, I was kind of like, why does the guy, why does he have to be like this? Right? Like, I didn't say like people were making it personal in the chat there uh, on the thread, but none of those people I really knew. But I know him. And so he made it, he made it personal. And so then I was thinking, you know, like my whole thing is I'm not going to, I'm not going to engage these guys the way they expect me to engage them. Like, I'm not going to directly like, like I'm butthurt and now I'm going to attack him back. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to play against it. Right. So I just said, I said, uh, thanks for asking Mark. Um, uh, things are going fantastic. And I said, you know, um, I'm producing, you know, comics that I believe in, uh, comics that I create, and and I'm I'm creating them for an appreciative audience. I'm bringing them directly to an appreciative audience, and I said, and I'm having the time of my life, something like that. And then I said, thanks for asking, and I and then um, my parting shot to him was like, but why do you have to be like this? Meaning, I know what you're doing. You know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to combat you, you know, the way you probably would want me to, because if I did, then you would have a ton of stuff to say about me. I'm not going to say anything bad about you. I'm just, these are the facts. I'm going to hang you out to dry with your own words because you're not going to hear it from me. And so then he wrote back. Uh, he deleted his comment, Mark did, and then he wrote another comment, and he said, he said, I was busy, I was tired, whatever, that's why I wrote this, and then he said, I, I apologize for punching down, right? I know what that means. So, to me, do you think this makes you look better? Like, like if you're trying to save face, right? So you said the snarky thing, somebody called you on it and wasn't mean back to you, just asking a, a simple, why do you have to be like this? You know, um, 
And so then you realized it kind of made you look bad. So then you deleted your first comment. So then there would be no point of reference. And then you acted like you apologized. But that's a backhanded you know, uh, apology. That's not a true apology. And, and then I started thinking about the whole punching down. Like that's a saying, like punching down. I'm not going to punch down. But the thing is, you're admitting that you're punching. So you're admitting that you're lashing out at somebody. So when you say that, it doesn't automatically resolve any of your past dealings. Like, like it doesn't make you look like a good guy. You still punch somebody that was beneath you. Like that would be like, you know, me hitting a seven-year-old, you know, to, in that in that context and like punching down, right? Somebody that's not worthy of, of your time, whatever, right? So, so the thing is, but you still did it. So you're still a petty person. You still did it. And you tried to make it look like you were being a good person. So if you're not paying attention, then you go, well, Mark apologized. But he didn't. So... I just I just found it interesting. Like like this stuff is interesting to me because I I can only get angry or, or this upset if somebody really personally hurt me. I've never hurt those guys. I've never really said anything bad about them. Mark gave me work when I when I worked at DC Comics. He was an editor there. And for I'm forever grateful that he gave me work. You know, I was able to pay my rent and, you know, blah, 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 you know, feed myself for a month. That's great, you know. Um, but just because somebody's belief system is different than yours, that doesn't mean it's okay to treat them less than human. It doesn't mean it's okay to do this. We used to understand these things. We used to get along. And that's all. That's I'm I'm going to treat everybody the same. I'm going to treat everybody like nothing's happened until they get to a point where I can't handle it anymore or they attack me in a way that genuinely was malicious. And up to that point, I mean, as far as I know, I've never said anything. I've never done anything to these guys, you know, but they think it's okay to treat me the way they do just because they think they know who I am. That's another assumption that makes them look like asses. They assume. That's why Scott Dunbeer wanted me to say I was a Trump supporter. Because by doing that, then it gives them the okay to fuck me up, right? They did anyway, but it really gives them like, they can clear their conscience, right? And then they can treat me like the worst person on the planet. Which is like, <laughs> how do we go from that to this? Like, I just don't, I, I, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not logical in any way, shape or form. And I, I'm not, I'm not going to say this just directed at these people that were in this Facebook thread, but just in a general way, what I took out of that is I really, for the first time, I sincerely felt pity and I felt sadness because their identity is so wrapped up in this. Um, comics used to be fun. We used to support each other. We used to be, we had commonality, which was comics. Who gave a shit about our sex, religion, politics? Who cared? We never even really talked about those things. And so they've 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 distilled me down to that one thing that they think I am. Oh, you're a MAGA Republican. Personally, I don't see anything wrong with saying make America great. I think it's weird when you say again, because then it opens it up to like, well, when what time in America's history are you saying was the great time? Right. And I think that's a valid question. You know, so if if he if if Trump was just make America great, you know, I think that would be that would be fine. But ultimately, I'm not hung up on that. 
you know, um, I'm, I'm fine with it. If somebody wants to wear a hat that says make America great again, what the hell do I care? Like, how do you take offense to this? It says make America great again. Like I said, the again thing, if you're a reactionary crazy person, then maybe. But other than that, who cares? Like, you know, and also like, you know, what was what was Obama's hope and change? Hope and change. That's more nebulous and scary, actually, than make America great again. What he's saying is like, let's roll up our sleeves and let's let's take some American pride and let's let's work on this country. Let's make the country great. You know, let's keep that tradition going. That's what he's saying. I don't know why anybody would take offense to that left, right, whatever. Right. But hope and change. Not that I took offense to it, but it's way more nebulous. Right. Like, well, what does that really mean? Like that could mean anything, you know, hope and change. I don't know. I have a lot of hope. And this change part, I don't really have a problem with America. I, I think change is overrated. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think we should support the laws and 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 infrastructure things that we have that are working, and then and then you know rethink the things that aren't. But hope and change, and then you realize what that meant. It meant basically devastating and destroying everything. So that was the change. The change was like fundamental. Oh, it was fundamental hope and change. So the fundamental part was changing fundamentally the way America is, right? Well, I'm sorry. It seems kind of scary. And also, I don't agree with it. I think America is a pretty amazing place. I think there are some problems. We can work on those, but we don't have to, like, gut it, you know? And then if you think about the policies and stuff like that, you know, more on the left, that's that's mostly what they're about. It's just like gutting, gutting everything. And once America falls, it I don't think it will, but if it does, um yeah, everything, it'll be just a house of cards. Yeah. Um, oh hey, let's change subject a little bit. Uh we got Kevin. Hey Kevin, I got something. I got something for you. Let me see if I can find it. Um, yeah, it's there. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. I was going to send this to you privately, but I'm pretty proud of this thing. Um, let's do this. Oh, oh, this is some other stuff. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is it, right? Well, this is it. <laughs> oh, you know what? It's kind of faded. Hold on. I can, uh, I could change the levels on this thing. Let me make it darker. All right. This is not only a commission I'm taking forever on for, uh, let me darken this. There we go. For um, Kevin, is this is also like Kevin's paying me to do some R&D here. So this is a character from 94. Her name was Juju for the ongoing series. And uh, Kevin was a fan of Juju. And so I had over the years done some redesigns of this character. And so uh, she is going to be brought into the next story arc. I'm calling it the Sins of the Father. So this is, uh, this is Juju. So I'm kind of, he's kind of, like I said, giving me R&D money to redesign this character. So this is this is Juju, and she's going to be uh, one of the big bads in the next story arc. So uh, she's a Valdun priestess. She uses um, kind of super science with supernatural, and so she can raise the dead. You can see like her costume. I'm still kind of working out some of the details on the costume. I have. Uh, I have two other versions of this costume. That's why it's not done yet. Um, so one of the things I always liked is the Sinbad stuff since I was a kid. So skeletal warriors or skeleton warriors. 
So uh, I like to draw skeletons. I think I'm pretty good at it. And so um, this is her with a with an army that she's raised. And this is a commission, you guys. So uh, one of the, um, I think I had two commissions uh, offered in the campaign. So this is one of them. So I think it's coming out pretty good. I think I'm going to use this for something else. You can see my notes. See the arrow on this one skeleton's head. I got to move the head down a little bit. His neck's a little long. I don't know. It's weird when you take a in and muscle off these things they they look like more elongated like necks and stuff like that because they're not thicker but yeah you guys this is uh this is what you can expect with the next black and white story arc stuff like this so we're gonna have science uh basically sci-fi meets supernatural so uh the Black and White Man versus Machine, Volume ones and One and Two, had uh, some su supernatural aspects to it, but they were um, a little bit more low, low key. So this is going to have um, more overt kind of supernatural stuff going on. So I hope you dig it. Hope you like it, Kevin. Uh, I should have that done in a day. I don't know what a pillow foot is. Yeah, you're forbidden to have your own opinion. Um, spits on the ground. Yeah, it's it's really weird that. Um, and the reason I, I I I'm sad and I think it's kind of I feel bad for them is because they think they think they're all peace, love, freedom, right? But then I start thinking like with that group think and the way they are, they're not free. They're the exact opposite because each one of them talks similar. They all talk the same way and they're all about condemning anything that's different from them. Like I said earlier, how can you be fair if you only think one way, if you only vote one way or support one thing, you know, and you don't listen or even consider the other side, then you're not fair. You're not fair at all. And, and you're assuming that only good ideas can come from one half of the world, one half of the country, right? Only one half of the, of the country can think of good things. The other half are completely evil and the world would be better without them. That's freedom. That's fairness. That's equality. That's, that's the opposite of all those things. Well, yeah, I, I don't want, I don't want a bigger battle, but the thing is I'm not afraid of it either. Because like I said earlier, sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. And so if this is going to be a battle of ideology, which is what it seems like it is, then whatever form that takes um, is going to have to happen. And, you know, I know that they can say the same thing that they got right on their side, but, you know, they're on the right side of history or whatever. But... I have a pretty good internal fairness. I've always been this way. Um, everything that they, not everything they say, but a lot of the things that they say, meaning extreme, you know, Democrats, um, doesn't ring true. There's no logic. There's no truth to it. So it just doesn't seem right to me. So... It doesn't seem fundamentally right just by a human standard, you know, like a cause and effect standard. Things that we all knew that were universally true, um, they're kind of spinning on. It's 
on its ear. Let me see what Anthony uh, says. Cool. I noticed I sent a friend request uh, to you on Facebook a long time ago. Also, can't send you a message on X, uh, uh, but will it out soon? Uh, love to know what you think of my art. Of course, of course. Trump says mean things about politicians and the media, so he's the devil. Yeah, I think I think also sometimes when people are very direct, um, whether it's true or not, but they're very direct, especially if it's true, you know, like that saying, the truth hurts. So if you're very direct and honest, you can piss a lot of people off. And the thing is, I do like Trump. But I'm not saying he's the savior. What I think, this is why I like Trump, is because I, I believe that this was inevitable. I think these beliefs and these feelings that people have had, especially on the Democratic side, I think that they've, they've always been there. And, and the reason I say the Democratic side is because they're the ones that are pushing for the change. The other side is kind of like, they're just trying to support what has been and what what works, right? But you have another side that's pushing just like ideas that don't seem to ring true. And they think that any kind of change is good, but not all change is good. And the thing is, I do think like two ideals going on is a good thing. So if you have somebody that's progressive right and they there's like these new things and they're going to help humanity you know um and then they run it by the conservative and the conservative likes things the way they are they want to conserve what works if you can convince that conservative that this idea that this new progressive idea that you have is good and it's going to be genuinely good for humanity um, in the long term in a, in a um, I don't know, conservative way, then it works. So I always think, like, if you have two people that are arguing and they can be fair, then the best ideas can rise to the top. So if the one isn't so hell-bent on their way of thinking and the other one isn't so hell-bent on the way they're thinking, and then they can have even a heated discussion, like a freaking knockdown drag out, but the best ideas rise to the top. So then who loses? Nobody. They were the best ideas. These two people hashed it out so the general public doesn't necessarily have to. We don't have to attack each other. Um, they do it. They represent us. And so then they hash it out. And then hopefully by the time these ideas get to us, you know, they the details been worked out. You know, the the extreme elements are gone. You know, that it's some kind of cohesive idea that would benefit everybody. And isn't that what it's supposed to be where a country – of united people, the United States. Like these are all fundamentally against everything that I've understood this country to be. So I'm sorry, you guys, my throat's really sore. So I'm not, I'm not like Mr. Enthusiastic. Um, yes, Webb, they want to be in control, but they still pretend uh, they're still in the 60s. Hippies, yeah, yeah, because, like, the hippies had this righteousness about them, right, because they were counterculture. But at the time, I can even go, there was some truth to what the hippies were. Like, they were like, don't trust anyone over 30. And what that meant is don't trust politicians. Don't trust those people because they got us into this war. They got us into this situation. But the thing is, those hippies, that mindset didn't really mature. It kind of stayed. And so then they kind of kept with that rebel attitude. But then they became the ruling class. They became those people. 
And then what you're seeing now, and I told my brother this freaking years ago. I said, when did the left and right switch roles? Like, when did they become each other? And I think it's shifted since then. But then it was like you had Democrats that seemed like they were more Republican, you know, because they were about censor this, censor that, and almost about big business and stuff like that. And then, and then the Republicans were like, no, let's be, you know, fair. Let's be this. Let's be that. So they were, they kind of had seemingly more progressive ideas or, or, you know, I guess more hippie type ideas. And then, I mean, it's progressed to a, a, a absurd level, but I do think like the hippies, um, got a sense of self-righteousness and then they basically realized that they, if they're going to be a party of note, they need to make money. So then they became basically the Republican party because the Republican party traditionally has always been about big business and war and all that other stuff, which a good defense isn't bad. Uh, a good, strong economy isn't bad you know, um, but with balance, but there's no balance right now. So yeah, they just became, they became everything that they said they hated. And that's the, the sixties hippies. Yeah, exactly. They're narcissistic. Yeah. Hey, Dillard draws. Welcome. Uh, Donald Trump is not a victim. I don't I don't think he is. America is the victim. America is the victim of. Yeah. Hey, Richard Dupe, what's up, brother? Let me see. Uh, there are 10 to 15 folk that always post on Scott's post daily. Scott's brain got broke by Trump as well. Unfortunately, that post on Facebook shows the hive mind. Yeah. But I, I kind of look at these as like, like when my daughter would get harassed at school, you know, like a friend, I thought they were my friend. They said this and that. And the other thing, they hurt my feelings. And I said, I say, well, think about it this way. That person that you thought was this person that you would fight for that you, you love and all this stuff just kind of gave you a present. They showed you, what they were capable of doing. So then you won't make that mistake. You can still be their friends, but you know the parameters of the friendship, right? They gave you a present. That's what I told her. They gave you a present. So now you know that they're capable of hurting your feelings in that way. So if they do it again, then you know it's coming. Or you know to be guarded in certain ways so you can expect it when it happens. So one of the things I, I, I thought of it as like poking the bear with Scott Dunbeer is um, just kind of reiterating stuff and just seeing if I kept a level head and I, I didn't necessarily argue for one side or the other, just for our side as humanity, just as far as America, like what would happen? You know, and it happened. You know, they pretty much attacked me. But like I said, I mean, it's it's bad for them. You know, it. it I feel bad for them because they're freaking angry, like so angry. Like I didn't say anything. I didn't attack them personally. I didn't attack their beliefs either. I just said, why are you guys so hung up on Donald Trump? He's not even the president. You know, he's not making policy. He's not capable of doing anything right now. He's in the private sector, just like he's always been, you know. And then they're like, how could you be so naive? He's he's trying to become the next president and stuff like that. So then you have to what? Destroy him before he does the evil? He hasn't even done the evil yet. You're already condemning this guy based on what? That he said, if you want the P, you take the P. Like, ultimately, that was like locker room conversation. And it was inappropriate. I don't know if it was inappropriate. He didn't say to the general pop 
populace. He said it behind closed doors, you know. But as far as I know, that's really the only thing that he did that started this whole Trump derangement syndrome. Um, but you know, I don't I don't hate Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was way more abusive, you know, and and not only said but did worse, you know. But I don't feel the same way about Bill Clinton as as they do about Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like it's just really, really strange. And and ultimately, their group of people tell them that they should hate these people. You know what I mean? That's the clique of people. And to me, that's not freedom. That's like fear because they're afraid if they say these things, then they're good. What happened to me is going to happen to them. So they're completely acting out of fear. I don't give a shit what these people think. I sincerely don't. You know, like I said, I, I think I have a good internal mechanism for right and wrong. I also think that's why I really love comic books, you know, because comics are, you know, G versus evil kind of stories. So <laughs> uh, you could buy two houses outright in Mississippi for 80K. Well, uh, if I had that, maybe I'll move to Mississippi. Yeah. Let me see if I can catch up. Hey, DeWolf, what's up, man? Uh, watch documentaries of how life was during the rise of Germany, 1930s, compared. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why they're they're kind of trying to not teach history and trying to tell everybody, new generations, that everything's broken, like that America was bad, like our history is bad. So they're basically stripping us of any kind of national pride and history. So if you don't know the history, then you can repeat it, right? So that's really what's happening. There used to be forward thinkers that would, uh, you know, give us the uh, the information, you know, that you could live your life by, you know, like the saying, if you don't know history, then you're you're destined to repeat it, you know, meaning bad history. <laughs> Guilt by associates a game for the walnut brains. Uh, fascism was imported from Germany. Yeah, that's that's why I'm here, you guys. Um, my main thing is the culture war, um, because. You know, I remember what comics was like. I remember what entertainment was like. And um, every every person that loves this kind of art form, you know, movies, books, comics, you know, video games, whatever, it's not going to be like it was. You know, these kind of G versus E stories, things like that, they're not even going to be, you're not, they're not going to resemble anything that you knew. Um, it's going to be completely different. And so I kind of want to get back to something like that. And at the very least, you know, the cancel culture comes with complete devastation. I mean, they strike with, with no respect that that's a human being. You know what I mean? Like, like, the stuff that was said to me, like that's, they're not talking to a person, you know, they're talking to somebody. That's why they want to put you in that column because they can put you in that column. Then they can hate you. They say they're not hateful. Then they can hate you and they can do horrible things to you. And that's what they're doing. Wow, this turned into like quite a little, I, I'm glad though. I think this stuff needs to be said and I, I do feel better. Uh, just being able to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Art is split on. Evaluate the facts. Each party has fakes. Research your candidates. Yeah, I mean, that's what I said, too. I said, I said there's been good Republican presence. And there have been good... Democrat presidents and vice versa, you know, um, judge somebody based on their individuality. I remember when when uh, 
Comicsgate was having a problem when Mike Miller and Doug Tenable were leaving and they were saying that, you know, CG is a cult. They were saying bad things about CG. And the reason, I mean, I, I think to me, I still have no, I've had no personal fallout with Mike Miller or Doug Tenable. I knew those guys before Comicsgate, years and years before Comicsgate. They both have helped me, you know, and I've helped them, you know, so it was just like comic says it used to be. But like the problem I had was when they say, like when they say Comicsgate, they would always say a person. They would go, this guy I have a problem with or that guy, right? But by saying comic seed, they're throwing me in that in there as well. And all these other people that they were in comics gate with that they considered their friends. And I do think that's why like John Malin and, and Mike, because I think John Malin actually thought Mike was a friend, you know, and then, and then Mike says these things and that's, that's a betrayal a friendship, right? So that hurts, especially if you thought something like you were, you were buds, right? So that's the problem I had with that. And that's the same kind of thing. Like if you have a problem with an individual, then you have a problem with an individual. You don't attack the entire group. Like if you have somebody at DC Comics that you don't like, you don't say, I hate DC Comics because that one person you don't get along with, right? That's just one person. So you don't like that person. That's okay. But this lumping groups in without, like you said, uh, DeWolf, evaluate the facts. Each party has fakes. Research the candidates. If you have a problem with one person, then you have a problem with that person. You don't have a problem with everything. You know what I mean? And you have to figure those things out. Otherwise, once you condemn the group, you can potentially make an enemy out of that entire group. And if that's what you want, then fine. But who wants that kind of heat? You know what I mean? So now Mike is public enemy number one with Comicsgate, and so is Doug. You didn't have to play the game that way. You didn't have to do it that way. If you wanted to leave, just leave. Don't say anything, you know, or if you have a problem with a person, then single that person out and then make it clear. I still like Comicsgate and what it stands for, but there's this one person or two people or whatever the hell it is. That's okay. But they're not these, it's like children. You know, the thing is, this is the scary part. I always thought like I was the most immature freaking person I I knew, right? Like everybody go, oh, you're childlike, you know? And it's like, well, what do you expect? You know, I like comic books and action figures. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I do. Um, those are my tastes. I got childlike tastes. Um, you know, you expected maturity from me, but then it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, I'm the adult in the room. And I'm like, when did this fucking happen? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like when did that person you know, and maybe I'm just tooting my own horn right now, but I'm just like, you know, when did that happen? You know, when did when did I become an adult? Um, thanks, uh, the wolf. Uh, it's okay to be MAGA, and it it's okay to keep your politics to yourself. Art, you played um, you. Art, you outplayed them. That's what I want to do. I'm not going to argue based on the way people argue with these people, with, with differing. What I've always noticed, do this, like the best results, like with a close friend or a wife or a girlfriend, don't argue on their terms. Because when they go, you left the cap off the, the, the toothpaste, you could argue about the cap and the toothpaste, but that's not what it's about. And you can argue to the death about it because there's all these other underlying things that exist. It's not about that, you know? So, so a lot of the stuff, 
if you argue on those terms, then you're it's pointless. You're gonna get art, you're gonna get angry at each other. You can come up with just as many reasons you left the cap off as they can why you didn't put it on, right? So then at some point it's a stalemate. And at some point you either get real with that other person or you you get pissed off. And if you really love them, then you cool down and then you move on. That's it. <laughs> I do think um, like there is kind of a lot of self-interest with powerful people. And I think like if you were a politician, it would be very, very hard to hold on to any kind of integrity. And uh, I remember um, Dennis Prager was asked, like, because he seems like a wise, smart person. They go, why don't you become president? And he said, because I would have to compromise my thoughts and my integrity. And he said, there are things that you cannot say to the general masses. There's, there's certain things that you have to keep close to the vest. There's certain things that you have to give half truths to. And he said, I just couldn't do it. You know, and in a, in a altruistic way, I understand, I understand that. Like, even if you were a really forthright guy, you still kind of have to play this game because you can't say exactly things in a direct, truthful manner because you can get yourself into all kinds of trouble. So you kind of have to figure out ways to sell things to people in a way that they can they can digest it in a way that doesn't piss everybody off. So it is a big challenge, but what what what's happening now is that you really there's there's people that are just they don't care about pissing the other the other group off even at the cost of their own business. You know what I mean? Like if you piss half half of America off or the world off, then that's half your market. Why would you do that? I don't really, I don't care if you want to be a Democrat, you want to be a Republican. I think both those things are important. Like I said, I think being progressive is important. I think being uh, conservative is equally as important. I think when the balance is way off, which it is right now, then it's bad. And I think when I said it, it has to get worse before it gets better, I think Trump came in and shook up their little world because they thought life was a certain way. And so then there's this guy that came in and not only opened the door and, and shined the light in, but got a lot of people to, to see that light. So he exposed a lot of shit. And I think that's why they don't like Donald Trump because Trump actually isn't, he doesn't make his money by being a politician. He's not really a politician. And that's something I like about him as well. He's like an independent, you know, I'm sure he takes money from different people and stuff like that. And he's beholden to special interests, just like everybody else. But, Politically, he's more independent because he doesn't care about a lot of these people. That's not his, those aren't his day to day. You know what I mean? Like he doesn't go to work at the, the Senate. He doesn't write these policies. He doesn't do these things. He's independent of that. So when he comes in, he still, even though he's rich, he's more of like one of us. You know, it represents the people. And the thing is, I don't think just because you're rich, that means that you're evil. I think it means you probably worked a lot harder than somebody else. If you inherited that money, you know, and then you're a dick with it, well, then I can judge you. Or if you made that money and you're petty with it, you do horrible things, I can judge you based on that. But the thing is, I think what, what, Donald Trump does that makes him more of like one of us, even though he's a billionaire, is 
he builds things. <coughs> you know, real estate, he builds buildings, you know. Hold on. <coughs> Sorry. Like I said, I'm still getting over that cold. Um, and uh and and I think he he still has to deal with private sector or or public sector people. He still has to work with workers. He works with, you know, unions. He works with real people in real world scenarios. If he builds something and it's not the code and it's it's risky and it doesn't hold up and it's falls down or it's, you know, he, he uh, compromises it. Well, then there's real world ramifications of that. You know, and so I think he's more of like, in a strange way, he is more like one of us. <clears throat> Joe Biden or some of these guys, they're, they're lifetime politicians. Who are they always going to be beholden to? They're, all they know is their little click. All they know is that that's their world, right? So then they know that they have to appease these people to get where they want to go. But they're detached from the real people because it's not part of their world. And um, that's that. I would never get in that Corvette with uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> uh, I'm with Art, the uh, F the world, uh, Art going full Rambo. Um, our true first blood. Yeah, well, you know what? Like I said, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I'm not afraid to get involved. Um, and I'll tell you where we're at and being able to express it. This is freedom. This is true freedom. I can create things I want. I don't have to think about, you know, uh, comic code. I don't have to think about DC or Marvel policy. I don't have to think about an editor. What you know, they can say things, and then I have to, you know, compromise what it is I want to do. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm really behind you guys, so I apologize. The world is having economic problems because they're all following the same bad economists uh, who are have who are in it for themselves. Uh, it's a it's bad it's a bad argument. Yeah, that's why it didn't hold any mustard with me. Like I'm just like, well, who cares? You know, I really don't care about China's economy. Um, and if our economy is so intertwined with with China's, then we need to we need to break free from that. You know, the only the only plus I see about a global economy or a global word. Um, Sorry, I'm getting really congested. Is uh, I think it'd be harder to have a world war, right? Because if everybody's in bed with everybody else, and so financially speaking, you know, my country relies on your country, and so on and so forth. Um, then, you know, why would you start a war with them? You know, because it would hurt your business you know like why would you blow up somebody else's business uh, all right uh, arts trash gas i don't think i'm trashing anybody really was this thread um no it was um it was on Mark Dunbeer. Uh, Mark Dunbeer on Facebook posted an image of uh, Donald Trump in an hourglass and saying something like time is running out or something like that. And so, you know, I poked the bear and put a comment in there, which I knew would, would you know, start something. But uh, I do think it's good every once in a while to be reminded that, that there are people out there that – would hurt you and would try to destroy you um, if they could. And so I think these are good reality checks. And so I don't look at it as a bad thing. 
punching down. <laughs> what an a hole. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Palacio uh, and Dino. Mark Wade has a lot of demons uh, he has dealt with, himself included. I think he is kind of his own worst, worst enemy. Uh, I am not talking about Ethan. Yeah, just just start a blog. Yeah, just start just bitching about shit. I I'm really not a I'm really not a nice guy. Um, I can be a colossal a hole and a dick, um, but I have to be inspired. <laughs> I have to be motivated properly. Um, sometimes I can be petty, but usually if that stuff comes, it's in the form of a joke that somebody might have taken seriously. Um, I'm a I'm a smart ass for sure. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, it's a, it's good every once in a while. I think a good defense is holding up a mirror to their belief system. So yeah, just asking simple questions. It's like, why do you consider this punching down Mark? You know, what does that mean? You know, and then, you know, somebody like Mark, I'm sure you could bait that way and that he would, uh, probably say something, uh, equally as, uh, mean. Yeah, Comics Gate is a safe haven. It's a good place to be. Well, I don't know about that, but I do appreciate it. I think I think Mark is talented. I really do. But I think there are people that it doesn't matter how talented they are, they're still jealous by nature, you know? See, there you go. There you go. See, Johnny's got the answers, you guys. I treat everyone the same. I hate you all. Yeah, I like that South Park idea where, um, you know, South Park makes jokes, all religions, all, just everything. Everything to them is on the table. So if, if you do that, then people really shouldn't be able to call you out because then you could just go, but just last week, I was making fun of these guys, and you were okay with it. You know what I mean? Now it's too close to home, and you have a problem with it. You know, that's that's on you. That's not on me. If you don't find the humor in it, then just tune in next week, and I'll be making fun of somebody uh, you hate again. <laughs> you know? Oh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Thanks for letting me draw the image. Yeah. I like Kevin's uh, commissions because I usually get to multi multi-purpose them. Oh, thanks you guys um, for uh, the comments on the uh, the juju drawing. I think um, adventures in uh, miniature gaming. I'll read it first. I wonder if social media made people uh, more like that or if many people have always been uh, that way and the internet is just letting us see more of it. I think I think these people, people have always been like this. I think sometimes, like in the case of social media and 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 I don't know, Hollywood, the press, things like that, they're they're making it okay to kind of be like that. So these people are like this, but then I call it like enabling the lowest common denominator, right? So they're saying it's okay to be like this or to be like that. So they're enabling bad behavior, but it's always been there. Like those people have always been probably leaning in a certain way but if society's saying you shouldn't lean this way and society as a whole is saying i don't know it's bad to punch old ladies right then 
as much as you want to punch an old lady, you probably won't do it because you know that society isn't in your corner. But what's happening now is society seems like at least the public perception of society through the news and, and Hollywood is that they're saying it's okay to punch the old lady. So those people that were already prone to doing it now have permission to go do it. And so basically what I think is, uh, is there's a faction of people that have a lot of power that want to watch things burn and are enabling bad behavior. Um, and they don't care what the bad behavior is because they just want to see it burn. That's why it changes every week. They have no loyalty to a certain belief or a certain thing. Do you think uh, Joe Biden actually cares about a transgender person? He doesn't give a shit about them. But if he can piss a certain group of people off and he can create division, then that's what he'll do. It's all about creating division. Hey, Duck Baker, what's up? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. I got Hamlet sent me this. Oh shit! All right, I'm gonna open this. We're gonna just turn into a unboxing. I'm gonna make sure addresses aren't here. I don't want to dox anybody. All right. This is from uh, this is from my buddy Gary Martin. This is what cool people that do comics. And the good thing about Comics Game is the cool people are hanging out here. <laughs> yeah, so we might not have a lot of them, but uh but they're all cool. Thank you, Gary. Let me see if I can open this up without destroying it. It doesn't really have a tab. Got my knife. It's pretty sharp. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah, baby. Uh, all right. This is Skyboy Comics. This is uh, Gary Martin. And let me open this up. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Brush with Destiny, the ink art of Gary Martin. So Gary Martin is definitely one of the good guys, even though he sticks his tongue at you. And... Uh, Oh my gosh, you personalized it. Uh, let me see if it's something I can read. Oh, look at this. These are good people. Let me see if I can do this without getting light blasted. Hi, Art. Thanks for all. Uh, thank for all your much appreciated support. Sincerely, Gary Martin. Um, Gary Martin is definitely one of the good guys. Look at look at this. His art book is fantastic. Let me find some highlights. Here's some highlights right here. So I don't know if this is still in demand. I I should know that. But uh, this right here. Holy crap! If you can't afford. Any of the uh, old books that uh, Bernie Wrightson had done, pick this thing up and you get a reenactment of it by Gary Martin. This is like Gary Martin saying, uh, you know what? I'm as good as you are, uh, Bernie Wrightson. Oh, I didn't know some of these things. Wow, Gary inking uh, Neil Adams. Yeah, my camera, if it's white on white, it's... It, it's really bad. If I find some of the darker pages, like these, these should do well. And he's good. Uh, he's funny on live streams. Um, definitely one of the good, the good guys. So if you guys don't know Gary Martin, he's been doing comics for, for a long, long time. Very, very talented. Uh, mostly known as an inker, but uh, 
he does pencil from time to time. Let's get away from some, some of this politics. I like comics. I do too. Oh, cool. And your trading cards, Mike Wilson. Mike Wilson won the uh, black and white trading card contest. So he was one of five winners. So uh, also, Mike, um, when things cool down on the campaign, um, I need your address, and I'm going to send you a stack of those trading cards. So that goes for all the winners of the trading card contest. Um, but I want to make sure that I get all the backer stuff out first. Oh, I said I wasn't going to do this. They're turning neighbors against neighbors. The hippies have become fascists. Yeah. Shout out to the Woodlands. Hell yeah. Uh, 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 uh. That's true. Man, I covered all kinds of territory. You guys should give me a thumbs up for that. Perhaps a super chat. And if you could, um, on your social media... I appreciate um, you know tweeting this out or xing it out, Facebook, wherever. It's all good. Um, yeah, I don't want to be the adult either. It's just kind of by default, right? Um, let's see uh, the metal pig. See, I think maturity is being able uh, to say uh, you like whatever without caring what others think. But think, of, think about this, the metal pig, how often you did not say those things because either, one, you're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings, or two, you were afraid of the ramifications. So uh, it is freedom. It is all those things. It's maturity. But at the same time, it comes with a price. Hey, Joe, uh, the trading card stuff goes for you as well. So I'll send a batch of uh, of your uh, black and white trading cards out. But I want to kind of let things settle. I think we're about a third of the way um, in fulfillment on the black and white uh, man versus machine campaign. So uh, it's 1,600 backers, you guys. So that's quite a bit of people. And uh, my wife, Pamela, is kicking ass. Somebody earlier asked how she's doing. Um, she had a cold last week. I have it this week. So she's pretty much um, doing like she's at 100% right now. So uh, she's doing good and she's keeping pace and she's got she's got her own little system man, and she's kicking ass. So I'm very proud. I mean, I can't do what she does just because like dyslexia, my brain doesn't work that way. But she's worked in business um, pretty much her whole adult life. So she's pretty damn good at this stuff. And she organizes things in ways that I would never. But I understand everybody's brains, you know, were wired differently. So what might seem like a hard way of doing it to you is the best way for somebody else to do it. I I that I'll go like, yeah, like. Kamala Harris? How did this even happen? Oh, that would be that would be interesting. I don't think they do though. I think at the time they were still probably treating Mark with respect. You know. Yeah, Ethan's really good at poking the bear, you know. Uh, he does things that I would never do. But once again, that's Comics Gate. Like, he's free to do what he wants to do. I'm free to do what I want to do. But we're still Comics Gate. We disagree. You know, not everybody in Comics Gate agrees. But CG is like America. It's one bonding agent right it's one thing that's bigger and stronger than all of us and that's why that's why it's great it's a great place to to be 
Uh, Nick Clark says unboxing is the opposite of unwrapping. Okay, sorry. It wasn't a box either, though. So it's somewhere in between a box and... Hey, I thought you were taking off, Pedro. Bunch of old ladies. <laughs> Don't put ideas into my head, Art. Why don't you go punch some monkeys? Yeah, Gary is. Like, it's weird because I... I've known Gary for a little bit of time, and Gary is Gary's Gary, but I mean that in the best of ways. Like, you kind of got to get get to know Gary, and you realize that guy's got a he's got a great sense of humor, but he's very low key. Like, he doesn't telegraph things; he just kind of says them, right? And then you just kind of like like the tone and everything is kind of serious. And he doesn't overly smile, so he doesn't let you know that it's a joke. And then you just got to go, oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, everything about him is good. <laughs> Black and white. Bam, cheap. Yes. Um, wow, Gary is insane good. Yeah. Oh, he closed out 80 days ago. So um, some people have shops. So go check out um, Gary's social media and see if there's anything, um, any links or anything, uh, and you can maybe still get the book. Yeah, I mean, who is that guy? Who is that guy? Have I caught? Oh, I caught up. Oh, no. Thank you. Okay, this I'm gonna I'm gonna close on. Uh, if you guys thought we were bluffing about the book being done, this is this is the main cover with the UV coating, and uh, it's a 68 pages of action adventure, and a very very proud of the book. I got some variants here for you guys. This is the Kenneth Rocafort. Or Rockefort. This is the Joe Bennett, who's now in the indie publishing realm. This was the first artwork he did after getting canceled from uh, Marvel. It's a good guy. Joe's a good guy. And uh, some lucky backers early on, we were um, we had a tier with the uh, the Ashcan in it. So I just wanted to show this thing off because I think. We're possibly going to be doing an Ashcan campaign in the near future. So this is pretty much, this was published, these eight pages, but only in the pages of Extreme Comics. And that was in 94. So this is the first time this stuff has seen the light of day. It's all blown out, but uh, I'm going to bring the stuff back. And uh, you got this bad boy to look forward to. And we might do it on Fun My Comic. We might um, do something like that. I think next week we're going to have Luke Stone on um, Pontificators, and we'll be talking about uh, Fun My Comic. And uh, I'll, t I'll pick his brain about uh, possibly bringing the Ashcan over to Fun My Comic and see what he has to say about that. So here we go. Hey, Pamela, are you upstairs? I Okay, you're going to read this. I'll, I'll, I'll blank the screen because I know you don't like to be on it. But come in here and read this letter from a black and white fan. And uh, like I said, you guys, this is, uh, this is a letter. And you can't really see it, but it's an actual letter. And so Pamela is going to read it. Last Yesterday, I was out doing some chores, and she comes out. And sometimes she has a crazy poker face, and it looks like maybe there's some trouble. Maybe something happened, right? And then I was like, what's going on? And she, she says, uh, she said, this brought tears to my eyes. Ready? I'm ready. You can come over by the mic, though. Dear Art and Pamela T. Bear, 
I just received my books, three of them, of Black and White Today. I immediately read all three as soon as I got them inside. I enjoyed all three and all the extras that came with them. I'm really looking forward to the next installment of Black and White. Thank you for the three great comics. Yeah. Look at she's whelping up again. <laughs> what a soft. Well, Let me see what you got. Okay, look at this, you guys. These are all the goodies. Those are secret. Oh, these are the secret. These are from the last. So if you guys back the secret tiers, we have goodies from the last campaign. So this is a sticker. These are very limited. I don't, they can't get it anymore, right? Right. And then this is the uh, the anti-robot MI-10 patch. Task Force. And uh, there's trading cards in here. Wow. That's pretty damn cool. Let me uh, go. Uh, Thank you, you. You can walk bye, in. Bye, guys. She said, get, she said bye, guys. Um, aren't doing infomercial. What? No. Well, sort of. Sort of, I guess. <laughs> Things aren't black and white, but this is for, for sure. You got a bunch of hi, Pams, in the chat. She says hi back. I've never heard that word used before, so she just made up a word again. She makes up words all the time. So now you guys have been educated with uh, the word hi back. Hi back. All right, man. Well, I think I covered everything. Black and white is still in demand. It's only going to be up for maybe a couple more weeks. Um, Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm going to do that. And also, um, like I said, Black and White will be closing down very, very soon. Pamela just needs a break. So if we keep this thing open forever, um, then she's never going to get any rest. But this is going to be the next campaign, you guys. This is uh, Oodles of Doodles and other stuff, too. So this is pretty much a high-end coffee table book of uh, 40 years of artwork done by moi so this is a beautiful beautiful book and so it was very very limited and we completely sold out of it and um there's a couple of these books now that are selling on uh on ebay for like a hundred bucks 90 bucks so there's a little bit of a collectability with these things and so we're gonna do we're going to do a uh, an Indiegogo. I'm not sure if it's going to be limited or or how it's going to be, uh, but we're going to do a pre. We're going to get the pre-launch site up fairly soon. Um, but we really want to get a handle on uh, fulfillment of Black and White Man versus Machine. So I imagine somewhere about the halfway or beyond, we're going to start really getting into um, the oodles of doodles and other stuff too. And since it's it's done we can go right to print and regardless of what it is it's all going to be signed in numbers so if we do if we do a print run of 500 then it's going to be all one of 500 kind of thing if we do a thousand it'll be one of a thousand so we're we're gonna we're gonna do it that way and what i would like to do since this community is badass we can possibly build a new version of this book so we can put a new cover on it so it'll be different than the other one. So it'll be like second printing. And we can um, we can publish. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a bunch of um, uh, comic skate drawings that I've been doing thanks to, uh, you know, Kevin, Kevin Thompson, as far as commissions that I can put in there. There's a bunch of uh, new stuff. I, I have enough work for a whole other book right now um, that I've kind of been compi compiling in my, in my part-time little bit of part-time I have. Um, but uh, yeah, I can, I could add some of those things in there. And then what I was thinking is maybe a preview page for the upcoming black and white since not only will we, will we run the campaign for the art book, we will, most likely have that fulfilled 
before I launch the new black and white story. So, you know, I could do a preview in there and then it'll give you a preview of what, you know, um, Sins of the Father will be like, the black and white book. So it, it, it could, the timing it could work out and maybe eight new pages with a new cover or as many as we can do. And we'll do those in the form of stretch goals. So um, the stretch goal will offset the extra amount for the printing. So the bigger the book, the more the printing costs, you know, stuff like that. And if we're going to go with a new cover on it, there's going to be set up. There's going to be a lot more uh, expense to that. And uh, and these are, this is UV coated as well. You can kind of see. So I would like to still do it UV no matter what the new cover or the old cover is. Um, and we, we also did a dust jacket. So we could maybe crowdfund a cool dust jacket for the book. Um, that would be ideal, you know, like making like oodles of doodles, second printing, like as prestigious as we can possibly make it just like a really nice art book that you'd be proud to show any comic book fan. And, uh, there's some, it doesn't quite, I don't get too far back. Like some of my early, early stuff, even though if you guys want to see it, maybe, maybe we can do that. But, uh, it's the earliest stuff that I'm really proud of <laughs> that I think looks really good. That stands the test of time. So, uh, so yeah, you guys got that to look forward to. So hopefully I like art books. I have bookshelves full of art books. Um, they're my favorite thing to find inspiration and just, just go and check out. So uh, we had that to look forward to. Uh, oh, you guys are talking about Mike, Mike Miller, Mike Millar. All right, you guys. So um, I'm going to take my funny little honey out to lunch and uh, and get some food. And if she needs any help, I'll offer it, but she usually doesn't take it. And, um, and we'll keep these books coming out to you guys. I do think we're going to the post office later today, though. Uh, so more books are going out. Um, please, you guys, post those, take pictures, post them on your social media, um, mostly to let people know that we're fulfilling. You know what I mean? Because uh, it's guerrilla marketing, not just to sell the book, but just to let people know what's what's happening to because uh, it's been a little bit of time, the campaign and, and all that other stuff. So we got to get people back on board. Oh, cool. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Johnny Rando says, if they're on your shelf, they're all arts books. That's that's pretty good. That's a pretty good dad joke. I'll, I'll accept it. Uh, well, don't thank me yet. If if at the end, if, if we, you know, like you, you, you get the sense that we were done with fulfillment or whatever, just remind me. And Mike Wilson, if you're still here, remind me as well. And, uh, and we'll send those out to you. Uh, so that's it, you guys. All right, man. It's been a blast. I love hanging out with you guys. Thank you so much for the support. Not just like the books. That's the obvious stuff. Because that helps me keep the lights on here. And I, I do appreciate that. Um, but also just freaking hanging out. man. I mean, this is a blast. I love it. Uh, some people, you know, like, oh, technology, world's going to hell, whatever. I I do the same thing every once in a while. But to me, this is a miracle. I get to talk to you guys, like, interact. Like, I was born and raised in a time when this was like sci-fi stuff, you know. So I still think this shit's pretty cool, you know. Uh, so I hope you do, too. Um, like, thanks for all the encouraging words, too, with uh, – you know, um, the Scott Dunbar thing. And you guys, like, like no hate, no hate. Don't don't blast these guys. But if you can think of a good argument, you know, stuff like that, then then throw it out there. Don't be afraid. 
you know, um, because this is what real freedom is. Real freedom is this. So, um, and I guess you got to be willing to take some, you know, take some blows as well, uh, which I definitely did the other day. So, you guys, uh, go jam on the drum, grub. Go jam on the maybe grub, grub. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Okay, okay, man. I just want to hang out with you guys. All right, man. So you guys take care. Have a fantastic weekend. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. Um, and I'll see you on the Kings. I was sick last Monday, so I'll see you on the Kings. And then on the Bros. It's going to be on Andy Smith's show. And then you guys, there's there's a lot of competition on Wednesday. But we have the show called The Pontificators. It's been going for a very, very long time. And uh, depends on the competition. Sometimes we do really, really well. Sometimes we do okay. So just know it's out there. Uh, we talk pop culture to death. And this week we're going to have Luke Stone and we're going to talk about uh, independent publishing and what it's like to build your own platform. You know, I mean, you know, you talk about somebody that put their money where their mouth is. Uh, Luke S Stone built uh, Fund My Comic and, uh, from what I understand, going strong. So we're going to have him on the show and we're going to talk um, for, we usually go for a couple hours. And uh, so, and then just catch me for my morning hullabaloo and whatever else. So uh, you guys take care and I'll see you later.